Ephesians. If you could turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Jesus Christ, when he came, when he bled for us, when he was buried, when he rose again, when he ascended up into the heavens, he did not leave you and I, as he said, comfortless. He did not leave us orphanos or orphans. He did not leave us fatherless, but he is here. He is with us. And he gave us every equipment that you and I need to live a successful, victorious Christian life. Amen. If we are not living an overcoming Christian life, obviously the fault is not God's. The fault is all on us. Amen. Either we are ignorant of God's righteousness, his love, his power, the resources that he has given to us, or for whatever reason we're choosing the pleasures of sin for a season, we're not utilizing them, something. But anyhow, God has equipped you and I, he has given us enough spiritual equipment to win every victory and overcome every spiritual need. I'm very thankful for that. So we're going to look at that beginning at Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. And it reads this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, to give us some setting here for the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, the very first three chapters, probably brings us into the highest state that human mind can even remotely comprehend. Because it's not just the greatness of God from eternity past, but it is also what Jesus did in our salvation. We tend to place salvation in the context of humanness. We tend to place salvation in the situation that we're in. We get up, we go to work, and then all of a sudden we're saved one day. We still get up, go to work, and now we just have a relationship with God as we get up, go to work, spend time with family, do our hobbies and all of that. But... In the first three chapters of Ephesians, it brings out this so great salvation, as it's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 2, in this amazing way that, you know, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. And God has foreordained from the foundation of the world certain amazing things for us as Christians that we're bride, the bride of Christ. We're sons and daughters. He's broken down the middle wall of a partition. He, the same power that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead now lives on the inside of us so we can live this fruitful, overcoming life. And so beginning in chapter 4, it's very wise, that's where they chose to put the chapter division. Beginning in chapter 4, you begin to see more practical, everyday Christianity. So really, the Christian is trapped between two worlds. We're seated in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're seated in heavenly places with Him. But we're still on this earth. We're still, our feet are still on terra firma. And it's this, this contrast that the Christian has to navigate every day. You know, Moses, even before the new birth experience, he talked about how it was said of him in Hebrews 11 that he had to reject the treasures of Egypt, accounting that the treasures of Christ were more valuable. So then we get to the end of the book of Ephesians, and he's talking about how to put on armor. And so he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Now notice, that is the force of command. That is not an option. He did not say, and by the way, why don't most of you remain very weak and very uh, uh, bound down by the world and just a very few super spiritual Christians become strong in the Lord and the power of His might. God's will and His love for each and every one of us is for us to be strong in the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? So God wants all of us to be strong. He has made the availability for all of us to be strong in the Lord. Now notice, not in our own self. Let the weak say he is strong. There's again, there is a divine dichotomy that we are supposed to be weak in a certain sense, but when we are weak, then are we strong in the Lord. So God has equipped you and I with certain spiritual weaponry to overcome all the forces of life and all the forces of the wicked one. 
So verse 11, he begins to tell us this uh, spiritual equipment. I know I've taught here uh, a year or two ago. I just really, I was praying about it this morning and kind of felt I was supposed to, to come back by here, you know, and in the scripture. But oh, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So wiles in the Greek language is methodia and it's methods. So the devil has certain methods. Paul to the Corinthians, he said, we are not ignorant of his devices. Once you learn the power of the Holy Ghost, once you learn scripture, once you've been in church for just a little while, you begin to realize how Satan operates. And you realize he's got certain methods. There's many times, many of you have had me come to you and say, be careful. You're about to have a higher intensity of spiritual warfare. Now, it's just humanness, it's just who we are, that we tend to think that the level of spiritual warfare that we're in is the highest level that we could possibly ever undergo. That's what most of us think. Most of us think, well, I am already at the summation of spiritual warfare. That I am, there's no way the attack of the enemy could get any worse in my life. But now there's an old saying amongst people who have lived for God for a little while. You've heard me say this too. New levels, new devils. New levels, new devils. That God actually, because He loves us, He protects us from certain things of spiritual warfare, just like a babe in the woods that God would protect from the wolves and the predators that are out there. So are we when we're children. God protects us. And as we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, He, he begins to allow us to enter into this dimension of spiritual warfare. And again, new levels, new devils. Every time, you may think it is the, the smallest job in church, uh, writing a letter to guests that come to church with us. And Satan's like, that is one of the biggest jobs in church because I'm the accuser of the brethren and I want everybody to think bad of the church of the living God. So everybody who writes a letter saying, we're so glad you're with us, I'm going to attack them. I'm going to just attack them. I'm going to unleash hordes of hell against them. Now, of course, we're on the winning side. Only one-third of the angels fell, according to Revelation chapter 12, according to other places in Scripture. So that means two-thirds of the angels are still with us. And, of course, the power of God uh, trumps everything. It is bigger than everything. But there are wiles of the devil. There's tricks that Satan, for the last 6,000 years, has... It's his go-to moves. It is the things that he knows works with fallen humanity. Satan... In a certain sense, obviously, he's been in the presence of God. He is a, chair, a fallen chair, the anointed chair of the cover, according to Ezekiel 28. And so he is very intelligent. And you might say, I've heard people ridicule the devil and say, well, he's not that smart, blah, blah. I'm like, well, I wonder why hell has had to expand herself. If, if Satan's not that smart, then why is hell expanding herself? Why did Jesus write that straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that fight. Why do you say that? If, because the overwhelming majority of everyone is going to end up in the lake of fire, they're going to end up in hell. That is not God's will, that is not any of our will, that is just scripture, that is just a fact. So Satan is extremely effective at doing his job. As a matter of fact, Paul had to say, if any man thinks he stand, let him take heed, lest he fall. Uh, basically, everybody I've ever seen says, well, I'm never going to fall, falls within the next few months. Amen. So I always try to say about the grace of God, through the help of God, through the help of the Holy Ghost, I'm going to serve these, I'm going to live for God. All of this kind of stuff, by the grace of God. So put on the whole armor of God, let's look at that. So notice, you don't need any holes in your game. 
Put on the whole armor of God. Everything God's got for you. You don't just want the helmet of salvation loins girt about uh, with truth and forget the God, uh, shoes of the gospel of peace. You don't want to put everything else on and forget the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So what we need to do is put on the whole armor of God. If God provided it for us, it's because He knew we needed it. Amen. Notice there is no armor on the backside, and that is because, as Isaiah tells us, the glory of God is our re-reward. God's got your back. So put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now one of the things in the next few verses that you're going to notice is that word stand. Why don't we all say that stand? stand. There's times that you don't advance, you just stand. This is a picture of ancient warfare. That as the two opposing armies went and met in the valley of the battle, then the job was at that meeting point, wherever you met, then your job was to hold ground. Every so often, you would go forward. When you read the history of ancient warfare, when I say ancient, just until uh, the last few hundred years, the first 5,500 years or so of mankind's existence, warfare was incredible. Uh, you know, just amazing. You would sit there holding an 8 or 9 pound sword from 6 a.m. till maybe 8 p.m. with no break doing like this. And you'd have a, a shield in the other hand. It could be three to five pounds. And sometimes a heavier shield, 20 pounds, depends on where you're Persian, whatever you were. And uh, they had different shields. Some had smaller shields, the smart Spartans, and some had larger shields, such as the Romans. So could you imagine holding an eight-pound weapon and doing like that for 10, 12, 14 hours? And many times you would be wounded during the course of doing that. And so, it was, your job was just to stand. And there would always be a flag. You would be represented by a flag. And if you ever saw the flag going the other way, you knew it was time to make a strategic withdrawal. My daddy was in the military. He was in special forces. And he said, they never told you. He said, the U.S. military never retreated. He said they just make strategic withdrawals. <laughs> Same thing by another name. So sometimes when you've got the truth, you've got everything, your job is to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has called us trees of righteousness. The goal is just to stand. You've got everything that pertains to life and godliness. God's giving you His Spirit, his name, his word, you got it. So the goal is, is just to stand. And no, Satan doesn't always come with a direct frontal. Psychological warfare, silent weapons for quiet wars didn't just start in our generation. It's been around from time immemorial. And so Satan's constantly coming from the back. Sometimes he dresses up like a fellow Christian. Sometimes he does all kinds of stuff because he is constantly, his goal is to take you out. And Satan never fights fair. The minute you do the timeout thing, Satan's like, good, I got him. And he attacks you even harder. He goes even more intense at you. So put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, again, let's everybody say stand, against the wiles of the devil. So then it goes to the next verse, and we are seeing that Satan's got wiles, and then, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now we're in that hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan. How many of you ever been in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil? Or some of his minions or whatever. People like to parse words sometimes. They're like, well, you've never fought the devil. You've just fought demons. Well, six and one half dozen of the other. Let's not just parse words here. 
But sometimes you are in a wrestling match with the devil. Sometimes when you get down to pray, the reason you just groan in the Holy Ghost, not only Romans 8 is it the Spirit praying through us, but it is also the fact that we are wrestling in the heavenlies. We're fighting in the heavenlies. And so just as Daniel was on a 21 day no pleasant bread fast and the angel appears after 21 days and he says from the very first day that I got to that I heard I was sent unto you but the prince of Persia withstood me then we realize that there are certain forces at work that hate us now imagine a being let's look at how bad Satan hates us Imagine a being that hates us so bad that he knows you're going to spend eternity in hell forever. And his goal is for you to go there. Satan, his whole goal, he is monomaniacal as the term is. He has one focus in mind. And it is to see you go to hell. That's the reason we have to seek first the kingdom of God in His righteousness. That's the reason we have to go with the scripture Colossians 3. Christ who is our life. Because a divided mind. Satan does not have a divided mind. Satan's got one. Satan does not go on vacation. Satan does not take time off. And we're about to see that Satan is a strategizer. He is someone of methods, the methodia, the wiles of the devil. He also has methods. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now in the ancient world that this was written in, the wrestling part of the Isthmian Games, part of the Olympic Games and all this, their wrestling, they did not have nice, kind rules like we do in Christian society or formerly Christian society here in the United States of America and in the Christian West. I mean, when they wrestled, they were gouging people's eyes out. They were breaking fingers. They were breaking things. And basically, you fought many times, not every time, but many times till death. It was the original version of what Satan is resurrecting here in the United States of America, MMA and UFC and all of this kind of stuff. And it was a brutal, brutal thing. And that's the way it is, man. You and I, we have to fight for our souls, for our families, for our cities, for our neighborhoods, because Satan is giving no quarter. None. He will not be satisfied. See, I've noticed this about the devil too, and you probably have too over the years. Satan doesn't just want you to miss heaven. Now that's the first goal, but he doesn't want you just to miss heaven. He wants to just rub your face and everything. He wants you to just turn into the most hideous, vile person. You know, Katy Perry used to, uh, she was raised in a Pentecostal household. Not an apostolic household, but a Pentecostal household. And uh, you can just see, I was reading a little interview by her recently, and she was talking about how the Christianity that she had, she's peeling it away like an onion, piece by piece, till she can fully understand how to be human and how to just live for pleasure and, and find meaning and purpose to life without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Tony Braxton was raised in an apostolic pastor's household, who, and she turned into a, a horrible uh, example of Christianity and and rejected Christianity. Sam Kinison, who died at age 43, was the most vile, vulgar comedian that you could ever even think about. And he reached the pinnacles of success. Used to be a United Pentecostal Church preacher. This type of thing. What Satan desires is he doesn't just want you to miss heaven, even though that's his ultimate goal. He wants to just, he is not satisfied with that. He wants to destroy you here. He wants to destroy any witness, any testimony. If you give Satan an inch, he will become your ruler. If you give Satan an inch, he will take a mile. 
The Bible says earlier in the book of Ephesians, give no place to the devil. So we're living in a day and age where Satan has launched an onslaught unlike any other in human history. He has never had the weaponry that he has got now. I do want to encourage you parents and grandparents to prayerfully understand what your young people are facing with social media today. And that in their pockets, you know, uh, I don't know when Playboy magazine came out, probably in the 50s or 60s or something, but in their pockets every day, they've got the equivalent of things that would make Playboy magazine look like a holiness publication. <laughs> They did. Phones came out in the 1880s, 1890s, forms of communication that people had. Now there are forms of communication through Snapchat, through Instagram, through any number of things that of course can be used for good, Facebook, but so often whatever mankind, because we have an inherent sinful nature, whatever mankind touches, we tend to demoralize it. We tend to almost satanize it. It's like, I was talking to a higher up in the military one time, and he told me, he says, what the military tends to do is take good inventions and weaponize it. It tends to take technology and weaponize technology. And that's just to keep us safe and protected. Well, human nature and Satan tends to do the same thing with the technology that is out there. So your 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds, we've had to deal with uh, counseling and, and dealing with 10 and 11 year olds looking at the most vile things that you couldn't even imagine. 10 and 11 year olds, because their parents, they think, well, it's okay if they take their phone in their room with them and they've got, friend, you might want to consider and I don't really care how old your child is till they're 17 or 18. First of all, you might want to have some great parenting classes and show them scripturally how they're supposed to utilize certain things. And then if they've got a phone, you may want to, like, sleep with their phone. Because if one or two in the morning, you don't know what they're doing in there under the covenant. They can be in contact with every weirdo and everything else. We just had this little deal where this 50-year-old kidnapped this little 15-year-old. And so this is the type world that we are in. So we're wrestling not against flesh and blood. Now that is another mistake that Christians make. We tend to think our boss, our neighbor, the person who hates us, the person who slanders us, the person who does things against us on social media, the person against us, the person in the White House, the person in Congress is against us. None of those things are true. What it is, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There is something beyond. Jesus Christ died on the cross to save flesh and blood. People of every nationality, every culture, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, according to Scripture. And, and so, Jesus has come to do this. And so, we're, we're wrestling not, your neighbor's not your problem. There is, a, there is a battle in the heavens that is what Christians fight. And so, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. What this does is in the ancient world, it takes us up a progression. Like a principality would be like a mayor. Principalities' powers would be over like a fiefdom. Rulers of the darkness would be like a governor and spiritual wickedness in high places would be like the president or something like that. So it's kind of taking us up a spiritual progression of what we're fighting. And so this again, once you tend to think you have, I'm wrestling, I'm fighting at the highest form of spiritual warfare that is humanly possible, well, once you win this battle, then Satan will lose some of these guys on. And just as 
in the heavenly world. The, the scripture talks about several different types of what we call in the angelic world. Like it talks about mighty angels, strong angels. It talks about, um, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, one star different from another in glory. It talks about uh, principalities, thrones, dominions. It talks about cherubim. It talks about seraphs. It talks about living creatures. It talks about the watchers. And there's all of these type beings in heaven. So, um, when Satan fell, who seemed to be, if Ezekiel 28, and I know there's some people that don't believe that that refers to Satan, and that's okay, you know, and, and all that, because it's specifically, obviously, talking about the king of Tyre, a city there on the Mediterranean coast, just north of Israel. But it seems like, as the scripture so often does, that it's the law of double reference, that it has one main point, and then it has an overarching point as well. Like many of the prophecies about Jesus Christ, it had an immediate context and a beyond context. Amen. An immediate context and the context of Scripture. God being so brilliant, so genius, He can write things like that that is immutable. And He says He answers prophecy. He, he does all this. He creates prophecy. And, and, uh, and, and that's what makes, you know, the Koran never gives prophecy so much. But the Bible does, and it's very accurate in its prophetic pronouncements and then in its fulfillments as well. It's one of the great testimonies to the validity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ fulfilled so many hundreds of specific prophecies of where he was going to be born, who he was, called a Nazarene, on and on and so forth. And uh, so it, it's a great thing. So... When Satan fell, getting back on that, there were different levels and strengths, evidently, of angels that fell with him. And so they would, if, if angels differ in power and might, then demons probably do as well. I do know there have been times like, um, and you know, we're Holy Ghost filled church, like when you cast out demons. Sometimes a demon will talk to you very weakly. And sometimes a, a demon will talk to you very strongly. Amen. Strongly. And uh, many times even, you know, you'll go to cast out a devil or something, and the demon will even say, you can't cast me out. And of course we can through the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Ghost. We can't. But those deep, so it does seem even wrestling. I had a friend of mine up in Annapolis, Maryland, Brother Chester Wright. I remember years ago that uh, he had uh, been in times of prayer and uh, certain principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness began to attack his church. And uh, I remember one time him talking about, this was probably, man, in the 90s or maybe even in the 80s, but he said he was praying for somebody and he says you can't cast me out this demon said you can't cast me out and he says I can in the name of Jesus he says no you can't he says I am the prince of the east coast the prince of the east coast and he said they were having a prayer meeting and he said all of a sudden uh, the doors of the place just slammed shut and all of this and he began and before that he had had to pray against the spirit of Maryland and and the different spirits. And so there are, again, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. So don't ever think, I've had people say, it couldn't get any worse. I'm like, you don't even have a clue. You're not thinking right. It could get a lot worse. So if it couldn't get worse, yeah, it could. Both your arms could get chopped off, both your legs could get chopped off, and you could be, you know, a, a vegetable. And still have full cognition. Sure, things can get a lot worse. That's right. And then you can get locked up in federal pen or something. I mean, things can always get a bazillion times worse. Don't ever say things couldn't get any worse. Things could get much, much worse for you. Much. Live under a bridge. You can live on the street. You, I mean, America could turn into something akin to Liberia, and it's known something against Liberia. We've had many contacts with Liberia. The, the president of Liberia is United Pentecostal. She's Pentecostal lady. And, uh, but, you know, where the, our missionaries, our missionary ladies in Liberia got raped multiple times. 
Many, many times. Soldiers came and just raped them. I mean, so things like that can happen in the United States. So things could always get worse. And uh, so don't ever think they can't get worse. They can. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So when we pray, we're wrestling. The reason you can't get to your prayer closet is because you're being wrestled. The reason you don't want to crack your Bible open and read it is because you're in a wrestling match. Now remember this. According to 1 John 5, Satan cannot touch you. And that's the reason we are commanded to give no place to the devil. Because once we give place to the devil, he has legal ground to touch us and get in our lives. And so... Holy Ghost filled spiritual warfare is very, very real. And it is the call of God. It is what the church is supposed to be and supposed to be doing. And so we're wrestling against principalities, against powers. I did want to note this against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. The pop song that came out that entices our young men and women to dress ludity. That was orchestrated. I'm just going to name names. I mean, these are people Jesus wants to save, Jesus loves and all this. But let's say if Beyonce comes out with a, a song and it promotes immorality and promotes certain things. Or a Hollywood producer writes a movie that captivates. Let's say Beauty and the Beast just had the first, Disney had their first openly homosexual character, even though they've had homosexual characters through the years in Beauty and the Beast. That was orchestrated. Yes, it was. Satan said, I'm going to do this because I, I know you. I know how to move America away from a Christian culture to a culture I can destroy. And really... He knows how to deceive the apostolics because the climate of the, the government so often reflects the climate of the church. Come on, thank God. God. And so that's the reason we're supposed to be a holy people. If my, okay, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, I'll heal their land, I'll heal their entire country. Egypt was blessed because Joseph served God. Amen. Israel was blessed because David was a man after his own heart. So this happens. We are salt. We are light in the world. And so Satan, a lot of what he does is not even necessary. He's playing chess and we're playing checkers. So often what he's doing, it is against the church. It's to, you remember when you used to get together and pray in your home, and now you get together and watch bad stuff in your home. You remember when you used to get together and have family devotion? People don't realize this. Did you know a hundred years ago in America, this is documents, this is secular history, in America almost every home sat and read the Bible every night for about 30 minutes or more. Every home. And so... And this again, this is just secular history. What replaced the Bible? Yeah, television did. And that's the reason apostolics intrinsically knew. People were like, were you saying I love Lucy's bad and Andy Griffith's bad and Leave it to Beaver's bad? Apostolics intrinsically knew redeeming the time because the day is evil that it's going to take the time away from prayer and worship and seeking God into vanity. All vanity means, people tend to want things whether it's sin or not. Vanity just means worthlessness. Amen. And so vanity of vanities, all is vanity. You can live your life just doing things that are not necessarily sin, but that are just worthless. True. I, I was talking the other day, and uh, it just really got brought back to my mind. I remember Smith Wigglesworth. Have you ever heard of Smith Wigglesworth? Ever heard of Smith Wigglesworth? 
And Smith Wigglesworth, like if somebody ever brought a newspaper in his house, he would throw it out. He would say, I don't want that in my house. And, and what he was saying was, is I've got real kingdom business to, do, to deal with, not any of this little tiny stuff here on the world, in the world. You know, are they going to pass Obamacare? Are they going to repeal Obamacare? Blah, 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 blah. You know, well, somebody's going to die lost. Somebody's going to go to hell. Somebody's going to go to heaven. Somebody needs to be uh, living for God. Somebody needs to be helped. Somebody needs to be encouraged. Somebody needs to be refreshed. The widows and the fatherless need to get visited. That's the real thing. Not this other. Not what comes on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, droning, on and on and on. That's not the real news. The real news, somebody got the Holy Ghost. Somebody repented. Somebody got baptized in the name of Jesus. That's the news. Somebody grew. Somebody had wrestled with a demon for two years and finally overcame it. So, there's rulers of the darkness. Rulers of the darkness. So don't ever think that in your life personally, and this is seen so exquisite in Job. You know, God says, okay, you can do what you want to Job. Just don't touch his body. You know, Satan could have just went and killed everything. That was not Satan's M.O., man. Satan's M.O. was he says, I'm going to make it to where I know how fast this guy is going to run. And I know where they're at. From the children's household to the camels to the ox to the sheep. I know how far it is. And I'm going to destroy everything just perfectly to where each runner is going to come to Job one right after the other for maximum hurt. And Satan got that involved over one person. Rulers of the darkness. So that's how meticulous Satan. That's the reason, you know, people don't want the church to be organized. People don't, well, we've got visitation. We got, let's just everything just happen spontaneous. Well, I believe in spontaneity and the Holy Ghost, but there has to be some organization too. Because so Satan is highly organized. That's right. Highly organized. So you don't want to quench the spirit at the same time. God's not the author of confusion. So spiritual wickedness in high places. So Satan, there's a ruler of the darkness. I just feel to, to just emphasize that. That there, everything that's going on in America right now is being orchestrated by the... It's not George Soros. It's not the Koch brothers. It's by Satan. He's orchestrating it. Again, everything that attacks good clean Christianity. It's being orchestrated. That's right. Any, any number of things. So wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Let's everybody say the whole armor of God. The whole armor the of God. The whole. Again, God doesn't want us to have any holes in our armor. Man. So take unto the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now notice this. We fight devils every day. But in all of our lives, there's going to come an evil day. Come on, come at various on. times, you know, the car is going to get stolen. You know what I'm saying? There's going to be an evil day. So there's going to be a day to where you thought everything was going pretty tough, and then things got worse. The cancer diagnosis happens. The leukemia diagnosis happens. The child runs away. Any number of things. Things get worse. You go out and you go to turn on the car. And go, so then God's blessed you. You got another car and it's got a flat. And you, There's an evil day. You go to hit the AC and it's out. They come and tell you you need new AC. How much is that? Three grand. You're like, well, where am I going to get $3,000? So evil days come. And so we have to have the whole armor of God because our battles, we don't always get to pick 
our battles. So we have to be sober and be vigilant. Because our adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So having done all to stand. So remember, stand, going back to verse 11, you get to verse 13. With stand in the evil day and having done all, everything you can do, stand. Then verse 14 starts with the word stand. Stand. So standing is a, a putting our legs in a certain position that we are not easily knocked over. And the Bible talks about every wind of doctrine a little earlier in Ephesians. Don't be tossed about every wind of doctrine. I have been, you probably have too, I have been in winds that actually blew me. Amen. Amen. I've been in winds that blow me the other direction. Been in winds have to stand like that. And uh, various times throughout my life. And there, that come, there, you just have to place your feet and say, it's not happening. I'm just standing. That's right. I'm just standing. In the Old Testament... There was two guys, David's mighty men, and the enemy came to attack a barley field. And all the Israelites left. And it said they just stood. And said, we're not moving. And see, that's what happens. That, that's happens with Acts 2.38, happens with oneness, happens with holiness. Every so often a wind will come through and people will say, well, uh, let's just, it's easier if we do this. All right. And we'll grow if we do this. But that's not biblical. That's right. And so you just have to stand. And it doesn't matter if everybody else leaves. You're not doing what you do because everybody else is doing it. You're doing it because it's scriptural. I'm just going to mention to you one of the most ridiculous things I hear from time to time. I've had people tell me, I can't remember who, but people over the, the years have told me, they'll say, well, why don't you do this? Because they're United Pentecostal and they're doing it. Well, that's irrelevant. That's right. I mean, the UPC can turn Trinitarian tomorrow. I'm not. That's right. You know what I'm saying? And it's not going to. I don't believe anything because the UPC believes it. I'm in the UPC because they believe Scripture. They believe the Bible. So I don't let the UPC define me. It doesn't define me at all. The Word of God defines who we are. That's right. Who you are, who I am. That's who defines me. And so we don't do anything. You know, that's not... Check it through the Word. Try the Spirit. So having done all, sometimes the only thing you can do is stand. And if you stand, you're doing great. You'll win a great victory. Stand, therefore, will come to a close. Having your loins girt about with truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We don't have time to go through all these. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. How many fiery darts of the wicked one can you quench? All of them. He can't touch you. Amen. And take the helmet of salvation. Think like a saved person. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Verse 18, kind of the forgotten armor. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I'm glad I'm on the winning side. Let's all stand to our feet. Amen. Glad I'm on the winning side. Hallelujah. Why don't we ask you? That's one of the things I try to do every day is equip myself with the whole armor of God. Because it, it, notice it says this. It talks about stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth on and on and so forth. It is something that we are put on. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. It's something we have to put on. It doesn't come natural. Let's ask God to help us. God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I love your wonderful people. Help us, O oh God, to be strong in you and the power of your might. Let the power of the Holy Ghost live through us, O oh God. Let us live, have the whole armor of God on in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love you, God. Why don't you pray for your neighbor right now? Ask God to encourage him, bless him really good. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we pray.